As always, some technical difficulties. Hi guys, uh, let me see if I can get my computer to catch up as well. Let's do a bit of a refresh. Video unavailable, oh, interesting. Computer say no. Come on, hamster. Yay. Well, so I've got a hamster powered computer. Um, and uh, yeah, he's obviously had a few beers today in the sun. So um, apologies for the, uh, the shaky start, so to speak. Um, so today I thought I'd bring you onto the terrace. Not that you can see a lot. Uh, but you might hear the frogs in a minute. They get kind of noisy. So, open the chat. Let's have a look. Fine, that's open. Good. Right. So, oh. so I've been out most of the afternoon. Um, I was laying by the pool lunchtime, got sunburnt. So, as you probably know, after sunburn, you get a bit cold. I'm telling my wife to go away because she's sitting to my side staring at me like this. She's really off putting. So she can go and watch it inside. Um, yeah, so I'm really cold. So um, that's a good thing, because it means I won't be out here too long. So I um, wanted to come onto the live stream today just to sort of give people a little bit of an insight into um, technology in Russia. Because certainly in the West, um, the opinion is that Russia is a backwards country and horse and cart kind of deal. And, and that's a continued narrative. And even today, you know, Russia needs to um, get washing machines to steal the computer chips out of. You know, all of this kind of utter garbage, you know. Um, so I just wanted to come on, really, and just talk about a couple of points. Um, and uh, not be too disturbed by my wife, hopefully. Um, <laughs> so, when I first came here, um, one of the things we did was go to the next town along from us called Novorossiysk, which is uh, a big Russian port on the Black Sea. Now, a few years ago, before um, some of the Baltic states decided to, you know, alienate themselves, shall we say, um, from the Russian Federation, um, there were quite close ties and there, were, there was an awful lot of trade. Um, give you an example, Latvia used to be one of the main ports for Russia. Um, but Latvia, I think in their infinite wisdom, decided that they didn't want to do that. And they basically said, no, nope, we're, not, we're not doing that. Now, from what I understand, there was about 3,000 ships a month going into Latvia, which Russia just went, OK, fine. So they diverted all of their ships to Nova Rossisk. That, I don't know how much that cost Latvia, but a significant amount. So I don't think that was the smartest move from a business perspective. But the outcome of that is that Novorossiysk as a port has grown and grown and grown. And certainly um, part of the Black Sea Fleet, the Russian Navy, is based out of Novorossiysk. Um, and uh, it's a massive port. It really is a huge, huge place. And like I say, we, w we went walking around there. And one of the things they've got amongst an awful lot of attractions, big shopping malls and all sorts that are all being bought and paid for because of the expansion of the port. But one of the things they've got there is a floating museum. Um, and it's a, an old Soviet battleship uh, dating from the 1950s. And we went on board, had a guided tour around and had a good look around. 
Now this thing is 200 meters long. Um, when it was at sea, it had a crew of 1,200 sailors and it could be at sea for a month at a time without needing supplies or refueling. Um, so, you know, it's a big boat. I can honestly say, coming from, you know, the UK and seeing um, uh, the Portsmouth Dockyard and seeing the Navy boats there and years ago going on HMS Belfast on the Thames and all of that kind of thing, I can honestly say going on this boat was the one of the biggest eye-openers um, I had coming here because, again, I came here with the opinion that Russia is, yeah, it's a backwards country, they don't know what they're doing. Um, but one of the interesting things about this battleship that stuck in my mind and really gives an insight into technology and where Russia is and where it, you know, where it was and where it probably is now, is this thing was just covered in guns. I mean, I've never seen so many guns in one place of all shapes and sizes. And as we're going around, the, the, the tour guide was talking about the, the different um, emplacements of these guns. And he pointed out that the guns on the tower on both sides were self-targeting and self-firing. Now, we consider that really fairly modern technology, you know, by my understanding anyway, certainly from people I've spoken to that are in more in the know than I am. Um, and I'm not saying in the last few months or even the last few years, but certainly it's a modern technology, you know, self-targeting, self-firing guns. This is on a Russian battleship in the 50s. So 70, 75 years ago? Self-targeting, self-firing guns. That, to me, screams of a place that's way ahead of where the West thinks it is and where the West wants to admit it is. Um, another one, Concorde. Russia did it first. Now, I've seen the Russian version of Concorde, side by side next to Concorde, in Germany. It's on the roof of a, um, of a museum. I think it's called Autotechnica. I thoroughly recommend people going there. Um, good evening, Bill. Blimey, it's late for you. Surprised you, um, you braved it. One o'clock, I think, in the morning, isn't it? Um, I hope you enjoyed the video, Bill. I hope that's suitable. Um, let me know if you need something more specific. Um, yeah, so I've seen, obviously, that, that plane, and that was flying inside Russia um, before Concorde came along. Um, the other thing, technology-wise, that blew, you know, my mind, and I've always sort of been a, not a fan of it, but certainly um, something that um, I was always interested in as soon as I first saw it years and years and years ago, was a thing called an Akrana plan. Now, its nickname is the Caspian Sea Monster, which the West gave it. Um, There's it a funny story about that, but it's, it's basically, you know, the CIA, I think, were looking at it on satellite images and saw it and thought, what the hell is that? And one, one guy said, yeah, it's a monster. And another guy turned around and said, yeah, it's on the Caspian Sea, but it's a Caspian Sea Monster. That's kind of how it got its nickname. Um, but this, um, this thing is um, a, a huge, huge jet powered plane with stubby wings that's probably a, a good description of it to a degree um, and it uses ground effect and it flies about two and a half meters above the water so technically I suppose it is a plane but it it comes off of the off of the water and it uses the ground effect of the sea can travel at some ridiculous speed 400 or 600 kilometers or knots an hour um, and it was groundbreaking you know the west hadn't seen anything like it um and you know a remarkable remarkable feat of engineering that was in the 60s 1960s um so if you've got a logical brain it's fairly obvious that if they had that then what have they got now so all of this nonsense about washing machine chips and you know, they're using shovels and, uh, you know, to uh, and all of the crap that I'm sure you've heard. Excuse me, I'm going to put my hoodie on because, as I said, I'm sunburnt, so I'm a bit cold. Ugh. It's all the nonsense that we've heard about how Russia hasn't got technology and how it's running out of everything. 
if you just think about just those simple things, then you, you've got to, with a logical brain, think that 60, 70 years later, this place must be a lot more technologically advanced than we're led to believe. And the simple answer is, it is. It is. Um, you know, from, from using drones in everyday life. You know, the police use the drones for speeding and for white line infringement. If you go across a solid white line and they happen to have a drone up, they'll see you do it and they'll catch you two miles down the road. And they'll just pull you over to the side of the road and that's it, the drone's got you. Um, I use drones for crop spraying, or fully automated. You know, they, they'll go to a landing platform. I've seen this and the things are the size of a small car. Um, and they'll go to a landing platform, they'll refuel, they'll restock with whatever they're spraying, and then they'll fly a pre predetermined path and it's all located by GPS. Um, deliveries, you know, our estate, I don't know about you guys, but certainly I remember in Britain, if you're on a new estate, actually trying to get somebody to deliver to you, even if you've got an address and a postcode, they just go, oh, it's not on Google Maps or it's not showing yet. And, oh, absolutely. You know, I know people that have waited a year to 18 months before they can get a, a delivery, before the post office acknowledges where they are. Out here, they'll deliver to GPS coordinates. So, if you know, if you need materials, building materials, and, and let's face it, isn't it bloody obvious? Um, but if you need building materials and you haven't got an address, you just give them your GPS coordinates and they're delivered to that. Um, if you go up the local market, the farmer's market, all the um, market traders, you'll pay them to a telephone number. Some of them have got a QR code. And you'll, you know, they'll have their phone, you'll have your phone, and you'll just literally go on to... I'll use spare bank as an example. And there's a section in spare bank Well, enter a telephone number. It checks the telephone number. It comes up and tells you who it is. The merchant, yep, that's who it is. And you just pay. And it's it's instant. You know, it's bang straight away. Yes, I mean, you can argue that in the West, we just get a debit card and tap it. But out here, they use their phone. They just use it as a, te you know, just as a telephone number. They'll, they'll send the money to the telephone number. Um... There's just so many things, you know, in in day to day life that you see, um, that that makes you realise that everything you've sort of learned or thought you'd learn um, about Russia really needs to be undone. Um, and you, I honestly would advise people to come on holiday. And I know at the moment you know, the world hates Russia, and that's the narrative that we've all got to bow our heads to. Um, but if you can just see past that and just think logically, two and a half, three years ago, everybody was, you know, not everybody, but people were, were happy to come here on holiday. So what's changed? What's Russia actually done to you as a person? Um, and I'll probably pound to a pinch of salt, the answer is nothing. So, you know, we're just programmed to follow a narrative and and I just I just want people to open their eyes a little bit and, and do some basic research um, but I would urge people to come on holiday and have a look just come and have a wander around um, you know the first place everybody goes is Moscow and a lot of you know a lot of the Brits come and, and end up in the Moscow region um, but Russia's a big place there's a lot to it so it's not all about Moscow um, so come to the other regions. Come and have a look. Um, right, I'm going to get my goggles on because it's dark. Um, right, this isn't really technology related, but it is um, a bit of a strange one if you're from the UK. In the UK, we will keep washing machines in pretty much one or two places. One will be in the kitchen, and the other one will be in the garage. That's pretty much it, unless you've got a very big house and a nice utility room. Um, but generally, that's you know that's how we are. Out here, they keep them in the bathroom. Now, when I first saw that in my wife's flat, I was, I won't say horrified, but I was certainly, oh my God, Massive electrical appliance in a damp, humid room. 
Um, I'm sure there's electricians out there that will go, ah, no, you can't do it. All I can say is they do out here and it's not causing a problem. Um, right, let me just say hello to a few people. Hello, John. Black Hand 713. Oh dear, hello. Will, yes, only 1 a.m. 1 a.m. in Australia. Hi, Sailor. Do you have a Russian winter hat? Um, I did have, actually. Um, my wife brought me one back. Um, the, oh, and I can't remember the name for it, but you know the one. It makes you look like a dandelion. Or um, if you fancy yourself as a bit of a fighter, you might think you look like um, Khabib Nurmagomedov. Um, so the big, white, fluffy one. But I left it in the UK. So um, I don't have a Russian winter hat at the moment. I just have a standard British Guy Martin bobblehat. Um, is it a good thing? Is what a good thing, John? Um, um, good evening to you from West Virginia in the USA. Wow. Hi, Nancy. West Virginia. Um, I've got a friend of mine that lives in um, in the US. He's well, a couple of people actually. I've got one in Colorado and one in Tennessee. Joseph, hello. Chris from Cyprus, hi. Do you know? Um... <laughs> I won't do it. Hello, Mr. Plastic. Thank you. I've no idea what that says. Hang on, let me try. Uh, Vlad. I'll go with Vlad, that's as far as I can go. My Russian is, the language is so tough, so tough. Um... They keep the washing machines in the bathroom in Italy too. Okay, I've been to Italy a few times, never seen it. Um... So Russia copied the French washing machine. Okay. <laughs> I'll take your word for that. Um, but yeah, I just found that really unusual as well. You know, um, a washing machine in the bathroom. Can't have it in the UK. Just not allowed to have it. You know, it's, it's deemed an electrical risk. But they have a different approach to health and safety here. As I've said before, it's the Darwin theory. So um, if you're an idiot, Darwin looks after you. Laser eye surgery I've got on my list as well. A couple of people have asked me about that because I made a comment about it before. Um, so yes, I had laser eye surgery in the UK. Um, my eyes, as most people find, started to deteriorate when I was 40. Um, and I went for a laser eye consultation and they basically said, your eyes are so bad, can't happen. So, okay, so I was in glasses at the time. Um, so I tolerated glasses and I put up with them for about nine years and obviously technologies advance and I later went back after a few years and um, sure enough this time they said I couldn't have basic laser eye surgery or LASIK um, but I could have lens replacement which is using a laser to cut your eyes open they then liquefy the lens and suck it out, much like a spider would do to a fly. And then in the pocket that they have created, they will insert a new plastic lens, effectively. Um, if that sounds really horrible to you, it is. <laughs> it's as simple as that. It is definitely a test of your mental strength because the operation is conducted while you're awake, perfectly conscious, um, and you, because it's your eyes, you watch it from the inside. So you watch them effectively pulling your eyes apart. Um, it's a very unpleasant experience, but it's 20 minutes out of your life and the reward afterwards is 2020 vision, no glasses, from literally instant. You've got to wear patches on your eyes, and I came out looking like something out of the, the fly, you know, like this with stuff on my eyes. And you've got aftercare, etc., etc., to look after it. Um, 
but the difference in vision was immediate. One of the things they do tell you is there's no guarantee that you're not going to need glasses, you know, again or for reading. Um, and I find more from my own laziness that I use these things for reading. Um, if I hold the phone at a certain distance, I can read it no problem at all. But we tend to do this with our phones and bring them close. And as soon as I do that, it's a little bit out of focus. So I tend to hold it closer and put glasses on. I don't know. Daft. Um, but one of the other things that they said when I had that surgery was that 5% of patients um, have a problem later on, which they then need to have you back in for a second operation. And unfortunately, that happened while I was out here in Russia. Um, I just got more and more blurry vision in my left eye. So it, it got to the point where I didn't feel comfortable driving. So I said to the wife, look, you know, we need to go and get a checkup because I, I'm not comfortable with this. So we went into an APA, um, went to one of many opticians, just walked in, had an instant appointment, none of this waiting to see somebody for weeks on end as we're used to in the West. Um, just walked in, instant appointment, um, I can't remember how much it was, but it was, you know, a tenner or something to, to check everything and full consultation. Um, and there was equipment that they had in there that I'd never seen in the UK. And, and it's not my field of expertise, so who knows. But there were tests that they did that were far more in-depth than I'd had done prior to having the operation in the UK. Um, and one of the things which was good was the guy who was examining me said at least the lenses that they've put in are, are, are good quality lenses, which is good. Um, but I'd got 90% vision down in one eye, so literally 10% in my left eye, which I didn't think it was that bad, but obviously when it patched over one eye, it was really bad. Um, so it, it kind of was a necessity. I need to go and get my eyes sorted. That I, f I was dubious about. I thought, you know, I need to go and travel back to the UK for this, really. But, he, you know, he advised that they've got a, cl a clinic in over a cisc. So along we went. And um, it was brilliant, I've got to say. Absolutely fantastic. Lovely clinic, beautifully clean. Um, lots of staff, very attentive, very polite. Um, and it was a walk-in while you wait appointment and they re-lasered my eyes. Um, I just had some drops put in them to start with and they re-lasered my eyes um, and checked my right eye and that was down about 10% at the time. And she, she just gave me the, the option, do you want your right eye done as well while we're here? And I, yeah, of course, why not? Um, so I had both my eyes done. Um, perfect vision again, apart from, like I say, my own stupidity. But that aside, perfect vision. Um, on really, really bright days, I'll wear sunglasses, but that's more of, again, probably, I think I've always preferred that anyway. On a sunny day, I've always worn sunglasses, so it's not me trying to be cool. Um, it's just I, I prefer it. Um, so on a really bright day, I'll wear sunglasses, but like I say, I think I've probably always done that anyway. Um, but I now have, you know, the, the vision that I had before. Um, and it was a hundred pounds. Now, I don't know what it would have cost me in the UK. I know what the operation cost me. It was 7,800 pounds. Um, but that seemed extremely good value to me, um, especially for the amount of consultations that I had um, and how many times I'd gone backwards and forwards and how the aftercare was if I got any problems go back it's all free afterwards um so yeah you know on the on the technology theme i think what i'm saying really is it here in russia is a is a big eye opener with technology um another thing that i like that i've never seen anywhere i'll be honest so i don't know you know i haven't done a lot of traveling abroad in recent years i'd say last three or four years but something that I noticed in 2021 when I came here is when you're out 
from the city and you're driving you know out towards the the villages for example where we are from Anapa there's no street lighting but two things one in the distance on a corner you will see a red and a blue light flashing so your first reaction is emergency services police probably so everybody slows down but it's actually a warning of a corner but like I say your first reaction is oh when everybody you know backs off but as you approach the corner they don't have cat size here they have solar powered lines so they have the center of the road is solar powered so it obviously stores during the day and then at night it flashes and both sides of the road as well so it's not just like in the UK it's got cat size and relying on the headlight it is actually illuminated and they pulse so they show you the corner as you go round it, it pulses round and also on the outside of the corner there are chevrons with arrows and they do the same thing they pulse and show you around and this is a long way in advance um, you know you're, you're two three hundred yards out of the corner I haven't seen that anywhere else but I can tell you it's absolutely brilliant um, for showing you where the corner is for the road and everything in foggy conditions for example um, or if somebody's coming towards you, you know, with bright lights on or whatever, you can still see the side. You can literally take your eyes almost off the road and look where the side of the road is because of these these lights. Uh, and it's it's a brilliant technology, you know. Like I say, it's it's installed and it's solar powered, so it charges up during the day. I'm sure it costs money to stick it in. I'm not suggesting it didn't, but what a great technology! What a great thing! Um, and I personally find it a really useful thing, really good, and perhaps it should be adopted a lot more certainly i haven't ever seen it in the uk um maybe because we don't get much sun in the uk hmm. anyhow let me um pick up some points uh, right. hello from sunny benedorm blimey hi steve benedorm I used to holiday there when i was a kid with my parents we were nearly drowned Ignoring me, Dad. When I was about four. Dad, Dad, can I go down to the swimming pool? Remember, this is in the 70s. I am old. Dad, Dad, can I go to the swimming pool? No, son, you need to wait for us. Dad, Dad, can I go to the swimming pool? No, son, you need to wait for us. Dad, Dad, can I go to the swimming pool? Yes, son, don't drown. Don't go in the swimming pool. Wait for us. Okay, Dad. So luckily, a little... Spanish guy was wandering past at the time and dragged me out by the scruff of my neck. Otherwise, um, this would be a different live stream and it wouldn't be me here. Um, sorry, I was referring to QR codes. It's a good thing as I'm stickly a cash person. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, QR codes have been around for a long time, but they never seem to, certainly in the UK, they don't seem to have got the adoption other than in shops. They don't, you know, private people, you know, public, don't seem to have got the adoption for it. You'll see, uh, there was a spate of advertising, you know, companies advertising and showing a QR code, but it, it never really sort of caught on. Um, I don't know why, but out here, you know, you, you can set your own QR code up. Um, but, like I say, people will either be paid on their telephone number or on a QR code. I can't say Brits are my favourite people. I do love your channel, talking your experience in Russia. Keep it going. Thank you. I can't say Brits are my favourite people. Um, <laughs> nah, that's, um, I, I find that Britain is not the country it used to be. It's not the country my dad fought for. Um, you know, Britain used to be made of, of good men. And... There are still good men in Britain, don't get me wrong, but the society itself seems to be in decay. Um, and it's it's just, it's a shame. It's, I mean, it's an old school management technique almost. Um, you make yourself look good by trying to make others look bad rather than just excelling yourself. And that seems to be the format that Britain and, you know, maybe some other western countries have fallen to rather than try to get on with everybody and further advance they seem hell-bent on making everybody else look bad so that they look good you know the the best shirt in the closet kind of thing 
Um, Russia has got a different attitude. They 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 cut their own path out here. Um, yeah, and I, I've got to say that I, I love this country. I really do. Um, I love the people. You know, it's it's a it's a friendly place. It isn't what what we're told it is, um, and it is very humbling at times. Um, bum, bum, bum. My mum in Belfast just paid three grand a few weeks ago for the same procedure. Wow. <sighs> yeah. Um, <laughs> it, it. As I say, healthcare out here is just on a different level. It really is. Britain, you know, we're brainwashed in the UK. Okay, as I've said so many times, and I don't want to sound like a scratch record, and I don't want to sound like I'm beating on Britain all the time. Um, the reason I probably make the comments I do is just out of the frustration that I felt coming from Britain to Russia and what I was told Russia. And it's, and it's annoying, it's frustrating, it makes you angry, why you, know, why you lie to like this. And... Um, and yeah, I suppose with the NHS, you know, we're, we're, you know, remember COVID, everybody's outside banging their saucepan. Um, you know, we're... Hello, cat. Hello. Hello. He wants to, uh, wants to participate. Not my cat. It's um, my little cat's best friend. Comes over and they come and play together. So he comes and calls for him to see if he's coming out to play, which is nice. Um, yeah, as I was saying, I don't like the bash Britain and I don't like the bash the NHS. And, you know, um, a lot of the staff work bloody hard and underfunded and under-resourced. And it is what it is. But, you know, we're, we're told that the NHS is the best system in the world and we're so lucky. It ain't. It's not. It's just not. Um, I, I, yeah... I, I've, since I've been here, I've found that the health care, the care that I've received, has been streets ahead of the care that I was getting in the UK. Um, and certainly, you know, when you, when I just say that I just had laser eye surgery, effectively, I was in there two hours, um, and it was a walk-in appointment, it was while I waited, you know, and, and walk in, walk out, um, wander around for an hour before you drive home, um, and it was a hundred pounds. It, it just, yeah. One eye, yeah. Mine was both. So three grand for one eye. Oh my god, that's insane. Absolutely insane. Um, what has Russia done in the last two or three years? You ask. Obviously, you approve of Russia's aggression against Ukraine. Hmm. So you've come to the wrong channel. Um, if you want to sort of go down that path with me. Um, I've studied an awful lot of that, and those comments usually come from people that haven't. Um, those comments usually come from people that watch TV too much and haven't actually done any research to understand why, how, what's really going on. What really started it? Um, what involvement other countries have had? There's, I could sit here and make this a political channel and spout on and on and on because of the stuff that I've learned over the last few years. But that isn't this channel. So if you wanna go down that path, you probably better pick somewhere else because it ain't here. Um, are you living near Napa? Why did you choose that place? So yes, I am. Um, uh, the wife had a flat in Napa, so she knew the area. Um, she likes to be warm. And it's a seaside town, so it's, I don't want to say it's a Russian version of an English seaside town, because that sounds like Russia has copied England, um, and I don't think that's the case. Um, but if you want a comparison, then that's what it is. Um, it's Russia's version of a tourist seaside town. Um, and it is a popular destination for Russians in you know in the summertime. We'll probably stay out of Anapa 
in the summertime um, because it's it's at the moment getting to an appa in the car is about 15 or 20 minutes in the summertime that can be an hour and a half um, because it's yeah it's crammed with tourists you know there's um, there's an awful lot of hotels catering for the tourist industry and because obviously the world is a funny place at the moment a lot of Russians are holidaying in Russia now so it gets very busy um, Russia on its own track it seems uh, yeah it is yeah I mean it's I think it's the only country in the world that's fully self-sufficient um, so yeah Russia's got got its its act together I think I think Vladimir Putin regardless of what you think of him I think you have to acknowledge the achievements of the country um, under his leadership regardless of you know your political views on the guy himself or or whether you believe mainstream media or, or, or whatever. And, you know, I'm sure he's got some faults, haven't we all? Um, but you can't overlook the record of the country and what has happened to Russia under his leadership. It has gone from poverty-stricken to um, people having a good quality of life. And I can tell you that... There's an awful lot of stuff here that is done for the people. Um, it isn't, the, you know, this dictator tag that Putin has, that the West keeps saying, he's a thug, he's a dictator. I haven't seen any evidence of it. So, you know, I speak how I find. But when you see that, like, electric, electricity prices are capped by the government, like, you know, for internal that you can't overcharge the people for electricity, you can't overcharge the people for water. Um, think of your own country, is that the case? Because I'll tell you, ain't in Britain. Um, and there's many other things, but I, I, I then go down a political path and I, I'm not, not going to do it. Russians know what Russia is. Um, people that are interested will use their own brains and do some research and the sheep won't, and the sheep will always be the sheep. Um, you know, it is what it is. I have no intention of being a shepherd. I'm too busy enjoying my life. So if you want to um, learn about Russia, if you want to ask some questions, then feel free. But if you want to come on the channel and be talking about propaganda and rubbish, I'm not really interested. I've got better things to be doing. Um, but uh, that wasn't directed to you, Sailor, by the way. Do you think this will cause a major collision with the West in not so distant future? Mm, getting a bit political, but go on, I'll buy it. Um, I think the world is splitting in two, um, both geopolitically and financially. And I think you will have two financial systems. Um, and maybe more, but certainly I think it will be splitting in two. And what interests me is how the two halves are linked financially. That's the bit that interests me, and that's why I'm interested in crypto, because that, I think, is going to be the key. I think uh, the West will continue on its debt-based system until it implodes, or they roll over to um, cryptocurrency. You're all getting a shake, because my little monster, who's come out to play with his friend and also chase the moths. So, get off. Um, yeah, I think they'll they'll roll over to the new financial system that's already built in the background. Obviously, I'm sure everybody's fully aware of BRICS and, you know, the talk of them going to a gold-backed system, etc., etc. It's not necessarily a gold-backed system, it's more a commodity-backed system, um, which makes sense. You know, um, your money should have something tangible behind it rather than a piece of paper saying, yeah, I'll pay you. And, it's, and this bit of paper is worth this amount of money. Because the reality is it's nothing fiat currency, you know, which is pounds, dollars. Um, it's just rubbish, isn't it? It's nothing. It's a piece of paper that goes in a machine as a piece of paper and comes out the other end with some printing on it and now all of a sudden it's money. And it's got a value. It's only got a value because it, it, it says it has. There's no intrinsic value. There's no utility to it. It doesn't do anything other than... You know, if you've got a match, you can light a fire with it. Um, but gold, 
is widely used in industry, so is silver, so are all these other commodities. So I think that is a far, far more sensible approach for money. But money, you know, every hundred years or so, it resets and changes into something different. You know, ah, 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 get off. Um, we don't trade goats anymore and we don't have a big concrete or stone tablet that we chisel value into. Um, and we don't use struck coins anymore. So, you know, everything has an evolution. Our latest evolution is cryptocurrency. A lot of people aren't aware of it, um, but it is, and it's already done, and it's built. So all the people that say, oh, I'm going to stay with cash, you ain't got a choice in it. <laughs> There's a reason why cash is more difficult to get out of the bank. Um, have you visited Crimea or Krasnodar? Um, so Krasnodar, yes, because um, I bought the car there. That was funny, because I um, came out of Krasnodar, uh, bearing in mind that I'm not used to Russian roads, and it was literally coming out of the dealership, and it's a three-lane motorway, and the signage coming out of the dealership was, to say vague is an understatement, but I've learned that's kind of the way in Russia, because they expect you to use your noggin rather than just, oh, sign says go left, uh, which is what we're used to in the West, or go where the sign says, or I'll stop when the traffic lights say. Um, but no, you're expected to use your brain a little bit here, and I hadn't switched over to that. So I came out of the dealership, and I said, do we go left here? And my stepson, who doesn't drive, said, yeah. I said, you sure? And he said, yeah. So we went left. No. All the um, oncoming traffic wasn't too happy with that. So there's me down the middle of a three-lane motorway with cars coming towards me, all doing this. Me going, yeah, this ain't right. Um, so yes, I have been to Krasnodar, Bill. Um, I haven't been back, <laughs> but I am going to be going back. That will be a, a video that I want to make because Krasnodar Park is amazing. It's stunning. Um, so I want to go back there and, and make a video in Krasnodar Park. Um, Crimea, nearly, it's 100 kilometers from us. It's literally just, as we would say, just up the road. Um, I was talking to a guy the other week who um, was introduced to me from a friend of ours from Krasnodar, spoke really good English, in, you know, embarrassingly so. Um, and um, he, he's from Sevastopol, I think it was. St Sevastopol, I think it was. Um, and I said to him, you know, how are you finding it? And he went, yeah, it's just, it, the Russian attitude is, yeah, well, it is what it is, get on. Um, but everybody tells me it's beautiful. Um, I've seen some pictures, of, you know, I've seen some video, and it, it is stunning. Um, and now, obviously, it's back under Russian control. Um, the money is being spent. The infrastructure is being built out. Um, probably not so much at the moment, um, but it's certainly, um, it's laid dormant for a long time. Um, and... Uh, yeah, now there's money earmarked for for its um, it, its infrastructure, as there is in a lot of lot of uh, Russia. Um, Putin gave um, an address a few nights ago. Uh, so regarding IT, so if you are into IT, if you're computer boffing, um, then you know as the sign says, Russia needs you. Um, they are, I think, as I understand, moving away from uh, Western technology, Microsoft technology, if you like. Um, and I think there's something like 130 billion rubles allocated um, for this project to get Russia more self-sufficient regarding computer technology. So definitely over the coming years, if you're an IT specialist, I think there'll be a home for you if, um, if you want to use that as your port of entry. Uh, I had a question about one of your videos, mate. You told me your house was around 15, 20 million rubles, but how much of that was for the plot of land itself and electricity? Uh, and electricity, uh, well, sewage and gas, inf so, okay, I'll try and answer that as best I can. Um, 
the land has doubled in price. So we paid, I think, about 200 and, oh, hmm, 250,000 rubles, I think, per 100 meters. I think, and I think it's about 500,000 per 100 meters now. Um, and land is sold in 100 meter blocks or thereabouts. Um, the well, uh, the borehole that we had, including the pump, the liner, obviously the cap, um, and the manhole cover, etc., um, and the drilling rig to come out and do all of that, I think was about 350 pounds equivalent. Um, what's the other bit? Uh, electricity. Uh, We've just had our electricity billing and everything's electric at the moment. We haven't got gas connected. So all our heating is electric. Um, yeah, everything. And we're running a swimming pool as well. And we've just paid the electricity bill for the month and it was 75 pounds. Um, so considered very high at the moment. Like I say, you know, everything's running off of the electric at the moment. Um, so it will decrease significantly once the gas is connected which is scheduled to be done within the next few weeks so that'll be cool um, sewage and gas infrastructure so sewage is different according to development ours is on a bio septic tank um, so I don't know how many thousand litres septic tank it's all divided up into different sections and you have to add bacteria to it um, and it works its magic and there's a pump an air pump running um, that was something that was installed on my uh, when I had my own business in the UK on, on the industrial estate that I was on they decided in their infinite wisdom that they were going to put a bio septic tank in for the sewage on an industrial estate mainly full of car guys and paint shops not everybody adhering to strict what is it health and safety i don't know can't remember my brain has switched off from those days but let's put it like this there were many instances of people just putting oil down the drains and thinners and god knows what else so putting a bioseptic tank in on an industrial estate, you know, they came round with a do's and don'ts sh sheet of what you can and can't put down the drain. Um, yeah, that was never going to work. Um, but yeah, so it's a, it's a bioseptic tank. Um, time will tell. It, it works very well at the moment. You know, maybe you have to have it pumped out every few years. Again, there's a guy that comes... Uh, Alexander Ross, I am from Australia and not dissimilar in age to yourself. I'm 21, you know. Um, and I'm hoping to spend some time in provincial Russia this or next year. Any advice for getting language tuition in smaller towns? Um, if you do not speak Russian at all and you haven't got any concept of the language, good luck. <laughs> no, I mean... Google Translate, obviously, and all of these other things. A lot of Russians do speak English or some English. The guy putting petrol in my car today spoke English. Um, but they don't like to. I mean, I had a conversation with the guy, and he was very nervous about speaking English, but his English was brilliant. It was really good. Um, and I said to him, you're English. And he's like, no, no, no. And I said, when was the last time you spoke English? When was the last time you had a chance to practice it? And... Um, he said, well, yeah, I said, so, yeah. Um, so, you know, a lot of people do. Um, it is an extremely difficult language if you come from a Western background. Um, just because you're loose, you, you're used, not loose, you're used to seeing letters formed in a certain way. You know, a P is a P, let's face it, or a C is a C. Um, whereas here it's not. 
And that's the hardest thing, I think, to wrap your head around. You know, a B, for example. Um, you know, capital B isn't a B, it's a V. A C is an S. A P is an R. Um, an R is a G. Um, that said, there's plenty of tutors. Um, our daughter had a tutor. They're very, very reasonably priced. Um, certainly in provincial areas, you know, rural areas. Um, there's several in our little village tutors for Russian, for English, um, for maths. So um, I would imagine it's, you know, it's pretty easy, pretty straightforward. Um, but certainly I would recommend if you're looking to spend a bit of time here, probably start looking at a language before you come here. Um, just to wrap your head a little bit around it, just even if it's learning the alphabet, and that's absolutely the first place you should go is learn the alphabet first, um, because it is a challenge. Uh, good day, mate. <laughs> Shrimp on Barbie. Um, what is that noise in the background, sailor? That is our frogs. Yeah, um, we usually have sort of four or five different ones. Um, sometimes they're having a bit of a battle. So you have one that side and one this side, and they'll be going at each other like tennis. And sometimes it's beautiful. If you've ever seen the film Gremlins, when the little gizmo, the little gremlin, the cute, cuddly thing, sings... Um, if you've ever seen the film, you'll know what I mean. If you haven't, watched the film so you do know what I mean. But basically, when Gizmo starts singing, it's all cute and lovely. And ooh, we've got some frogs that do that. I'm assuming they're frogs. Hmm. i better go and have a look, see if they're mogwai. Um, yeah. Uh, loud. Very loud. Uh, Alexander Ross, what were? Uh, what were, what were, what were? Um, don't know, what were? Uh, learn to read the outfit, which will help. Yes, definitely. Um, Alien from Mars, hi. I might have missed why, but why is there a door in your fence connecting it to the neighbor's house? Uh, so I cut the neighbor's grass. And we didn't have a fence there um, at all. So I put a fence up. And there's a hole in the back garden uh, for putting waste, grass, clippings and food waste, etc, etc. Um, so when I put the fence up, I put a gate in it so I can still go in there and fill the, um, the uh, hole in the ground up and cut the grass. If you have some basic Russian, but not great, and you want to improve, um, you're going to be way ahead of me. I'm definitely the wrong person to ask for advice on speaking Russian. Because um, I do Duolingo every day. I've got, yeah, I can't remember how many days streak, but I do it every day. And it's a challenge. Yeah, it's a challenge. Um... <laughs> That's neat. Yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah it's kind of cool. Um, also wanted to ask you about your biggest surprises encountered about moving to Russia, both good and bad. Biggest surprises is everything. Literally everything. Um, you know, I came here not expecting the climate. You know, we... we um, when we came here... Um, for the first time, we landed at the Krasnodar Airport um, at 2 o'clock, I think, in the morning, or certainly early hours, and it was warm. Uh, so that threw me, you know, because Russia's just snow, isn't it? Um, so climate. Um, since then, I would say the biggest surprise is how Russians don't behave like we do in the West. So in the West, now, Russians are monsters. We hate them. Must hate them. Because the press tells us we've got to hate them. We don't know why we need to hate them. 
but the press has told us we need to hate them because they're monsters. So, okay, we hate them. Um, and I would imagine that most uh, places in the West, if not all, are stripped of anything to do with Russia in any way, shape or form, be it clothing or books or shops, food, anything at all. Anything that even slightly mentions the word or even starts to mention the word, I'm sure, will be taboo. Um, and it's not here. So you'll go into shops and you'll see American clothing, you know, Baltimore, Brooklyn, you know, New York, you know, all of this kind of stuff. Um, I saw a couple today pushing a push chair, a pram, you know, with a little in it, and the sun cover was a Union Jack. Um, I saw a guy the other day riding a bicycle down the seafront, covered it in an American flag. Um, they're, they're not wired like us. Russians are not wired like us. They are not hateful. They are not... Um, they just, they have the proper attitude. They're not children. It's not a playground. They have a proper attitude. Their attitude is, you know, when you sort of say, oh, you must hate me because I'm British. Their attitude is, why? What have you done to me? And that's what we should all focus on. Everybody should. That's the attitude we should all have. Not because some stupid rag of a newspaper has told us that that's what we need to do because this is true and it's not, you know, let's face it. Newspapers should be used for lighting fires and that's all because they're of absolutely no use for anything else other than swatting flies because it's hard to swat a fly with a television, let's face it. Um, but that's all they're useful for. You know, they're, they're, they're just... just absolute rubbish um, and anybody with a brain knows that and they don't really focus on it but we still have that mentality you know Russia bad because Russia's bad now you know um, but the, the Russians aren't wired like that they're just not wired like that um, you know the British government may have may or not may is doing a lot of things that are very bad towards Russians. Um, but Russians view it as the British government. They don't view it as the British people. And equally, they don't view it as the American people. So, and that's an important thing. If you're in America, you need to understand. You can come to Russia and you can wear your American flag if you want to. You're not gonna be stabbed. You're not gonna be murdered. You're not gonna be accosted because they're just not programmed the way we are. So it's really important that people understand that. Um, they just don't have that mentality. Uh, John, Martin in Orenburg. Um, sorry, Russia both good and bad. Yeah, I hope I answered that. Mm, it's really vague. The simple answer is, for me, everything's better. I suppose the roads, some of the back roads aren't as good. Uh, well, they're definitely not, you know, they're, they're unmade roads because um, Russia's a big place and a tarmac it, well, yeah, you need a, a, an awful lot of people to tarmac it. Um, so the roads probably... I'm trying to think, I really am trying to think. Price of cars. Cars are more expensive. Um, give you an example my Range Rover that I had in the UK was about 70 grand in the UK out here would probably be about 160 grand equivalent so cars are expensive um, Martin and Orenberg before their recent flood disaster went back to the UK picked up his car and drove back to <laughs> Siberia okay uh, do the Russian authorities allow this um, I don't see why they wouldn't. Um, I mean, Russia hasn't closed its borders to the UK. Um, the UK closed its airports to Russian airlines, but Russia didn't do that. Um, 
So, yeah, there's no reason why you can't. You, you know, I, if you can f fly to Russia and come across the border, then there's no reason why you can't drive. Um, I would say your only restriction at the border will be the country in which you're in, which may object um, because, you know, Russia bad. Um, but from the Russian side, no, nah, as long as you've got your documentation correct um, and your entry visa, no problem. Not that I'm aware of. Uh, how far are you from the beach? What is there to do recreation-wise in the Napa region? Um, so I'll break this apart. So how far are we from the beach? Um, now, about 15 minutes, if I drove now. In peak holiday nutcase season, about an hour and a half. Um, probably about 20 kilometers. Um, but it really depends on the time of day and season. The beach is amazing. It's 40 odd kilometers of sand. Um, so it's an amazing beach. Um, I'm not a great sea person, hence the swimming pool. Um, but I was in the sea there last year and I did a video from the middle of the sea. I was standing in the sea up to my waist and I did a video from there and it was 31 degrees, I think. So amazingly warm, never felt sea like it. You come from England, you know what the sea is. It's green and it's murky and it's poo floating in it and it's really unpleasant. Um, and here it's crystal clear, crystal clear. Um, and very shallow entry, so it's great for kids. You know, families it's wonderful for. Um, there's no sort of shelf that they fall off and it gets really deep. You just keep walking out and walking out until you're to a depth that you want to be. Um, and like I say, it's just sand. So the only thing you've got to watch out for is the jellyfish in jellyfish season, which I didn't know about till I um, felt something touch my leg and I thought, what the hell's that? And then I looked down and it was, well, I thought it was a bag, to be honest. I carried on and I felt something again and it was a bit stingy, itchy. I looked down and it's a purple thing, about sort of this size. I thought, it's a bloody jellyfish. And then it happened again. And I thought, yeah, that's a bit uncomfortable. It felt like a stinging nettle. And um, it was about this big. Oh, well, that's a jellyfish, Chris. Yeah, trying to get out of the water. So we got out of the water at that point. So yeah, I got stung by a jellyfish last year, or twice. Um, so what is there to do recreation-wise? Uh, hunt jellyfish. Um, hunt mosquitoes in the season. It's my other favourite pastime. That should be a national sport. Um, Recreation-wise, it's a seaside town. So you've got water parks, um, you've got lots of um, touristy kind of parks, you know, things for the kids to do, lots of that sort of thing, you know, go-karts and big wheels and um, funfair rides and all that kind of stuff. Um, if you come out a bit further, it's a wine region, so there are lots of vineyards around that you can go and visit, and they're all different shapes, sizes, and colors. Um, we visited a few, um, and they're lovely, they really are. You can go just go for a walk around them. You know, you, you, you haven't got to pay. You just go there and you can go wandering around the grapes. It's amazing, <laughs> it's really amazing. Um, in the UK, it'd all be gated off and you'd have to pay an admission fee and you wouldn't be able to go near a grape. You could look at it through a glass window, I'm sure, but that would be it. But no, here, you can go wander around them. Um, 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 you've got an area called a brow de so, which is um, linked to, as I say, grapes and vineyard. Um, lovely wine producer in the, this region. Um, makes our favourite champagne. And they've got their own their own area, their own region. Um, look it up. It's in between Anapa and Novorossiysk, more nearer to a Novorossiysk. And it's just a big lake, and it's it's just a really nice area. They've they've recently put some um, granite paths all the way around, um, and you can go there for your lunch or your dinner. And they put on evening events and various bits and pieces. Same in Anapa in the town. Um, You've got the fountains in the town, which are all lit up at night and dance to the music. Um, and 
probably not so much at the moment, um, but certainly in um, uh, pre SMO, shall we say, um, there were a lot of concerts in the town, just open air concerts, um, not big affairs, you know, just various groups and people singing and performing, all for free. Um, oh God, Cat, what are you doing? Rios. Yeah, sorry. Um, oh dear, what else? You've got a volcano nearby, which I did a video on when I had a look at. Um, to be honest, I'm not probably the best person to ask. I haven't really been here long enough to understand what is available to do everywhere. Um, and we've tended to make our home somewhere where we want to be. So the garden, you know, we're making the garden nice. I've got plans. We're going to be starting the sauna soon, um, the outdoor shower room, and we've got a movie room to build. Um, obviously, we've got the swimming pool. Um, so we've made it, you know, with nice balconies, etc. So we've made it somewhere where we want to be. Um, so we haven't done much venturing out, which is kind of sad because we should do, um, but we haven't. So, um, and what is the weather like? <sighs> wow. Uh, well, I'm sunburnt. It was 25 degrees today. Um, the winters, I would say, are like a British winter, but nowhere near as long or as... I wish you could see this bloody cat. Um, I didn't know you could jump that high. That's the worry. Um, yeah, the, the winters aren't as long and they're not as horribly damp. Um, so they're more crisp when they go cold. But you do get snow here. We had snow this year, two or three times. It was great. We're out in snowball fights and building snowmen. Um, but it's not anything like Orenburg. We, you know, that, unfortunately, we don't have that level of snow here. Um, but the summers, you know, summer, peak summer is hot. You know, late 30s, early 40s even. Um, but as we say, it's a different kind of heat because it is, um, you know, it's not as humid. So, uh, it's, it's hot for sure, but it's not drenching hot, if that makes sense. I don't know if it does. You know, if you had 30 degrees in the UK, you'd be dead. It's horrible. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm out here in a hoodie and yeah, it's, it's probably 17 or 18 degrees at the moment, but I've got acclimatised to it a bit. And, um, yeah. Um, and thank you for your channel. It's great to get info about the South of Russia. Thank you. You're welcome. I am more than happy to answer any questions. Anybody got anything specific that they want to know? Um, I'll do my best to answer it. Um, if I can't, I'll tell you I don't. I, I don't know. And if I can find out, I will. Um, Bill actually um, was curious about an Napa and I did him a little video this afternoon. I don't know if it was any use to him or not. Um, hopefully it was. Um, but uh, I didn't go where I thought we were going to go. And uh, making the West poorer. They don't care. They have to stop button. Yeah, there's no reverse gear for the West, unfortunately. Um, they don't know Russia. They don't understand Russia. Um, their whole thesis on Russia is based on archaic understanding of Russia and the Russian people. Um, I wish I was younger and moved from the West. Well, I don't know how old you are. Rosemary Smith, I do not know how old you are. And I certainly ain't going to ask because that's a no-no. You don't do that. Them's the rules. Um, yeah, gee. Oh dear, you're worried about your family and not take you serious. Yeah, I mean, I think at some point you've got to live your life. If you, I mean, I, I, the way I dealt with it, without going into personal details, um, but the way I dealt with leaving the UK was, 
I spent an awful lot of my previous years traveling around Europe with a race team, um, gone for four, five, six, seven days at a time, um, several tours of Scotland for a week at a time, several tours around Europe, driving for a week or two weeks at a time. So I was no further away really in time for example, if I was in Scotland and I needed to be back home on the south coast, it was a 12 hour drive. Um, and, you know, I could get from here home when the airports were open again and when the nonsense is over um, in half of that time. So, you know, it, it's not it's not like the back and beyond. And modern technology makes a hell of a difference. We can do this, you know. Um, and I find that so much, it was difficult, it was hard, but being able to WhatsApp or FaceTime or whatever, you know, whatever format you use is invaluable. Um, and I think sometimes you've got to do what's best for you and your family as well. And it may not be the obvious thing. Um, but there's certainly, there are horror stories people have, you know, told family members, oh, you're going to get murdered, um, you know, you, the Russians will kill you, and all, all this utter crap, honestly. <laughs> um, yeah, they're very warm, very welcoming people, very friendly. My neighbours are Ukrainian. What's that tell you? I think it should tell you a lot. It should tell you that... Um, Russians and Ukrainians live side by side in Russia. Newsflash. Sorry. Shocked to break it to you. It's not what you're told. Simple as. It's not what you're told. Um, how many kids do you have? I have two of my own children and technically three stepchildren, technically, um, one of which I haven't met. Um, yeah. How much does it cost to put the swimming pool in? So how much did it cost us? So this particular pool cost us around two million rubles. Say it quick, um, but it's eight by four meters. Um, you know, we've got nice stones around the top of it. It's a salt water pool. Um, it has a computer to do the dosing. Um, we've got steps in the corner. With a swimming pool, it's a bit like a car. Um, it really depends on what you want and you can spend an awful lot more and you can spend a bit less as well. So it really depends what you want. Um, you know, you can have a, a much smaller pool, it'd be a lot cheaper, um, obviously. So, yeah. I guess the prices of cars is a result of sanctions or was it always like that? Um, I don't honestly know, Sailor. Um, I'm guessing it's a result of, of sanctions but I don't I don't honestly know um, what difference does it make to real people in the real world well there's still plenty of cars on the road and there's still plenty of high-end cars on the road latest stuff you know latest Mercs latest BMs um, so there's there's still plenty going on some reason my laptop is buffering, which is always useful. I'll catch up now, will you? Yes, no, maybe. Um, yeah, it, it probably is as a result of sanctions, but I don't know. I, I hadn't come to Russia um, and studied the, the prices um, before, um, so I don't really know. Um, yeah. 
Um, right. What's the time? 74 minutes. God, I said I was only going to go on for an hour. Um, last time I, I came on a live, it was nearly four hours and I waffled on. Bored the pants out of everybody, I'm sure. So I definitely don't want to be doing that. So we'll start to um, probably wrap this up, I think. Um, hopefully I've covered off some stuff that you found of interest. As always, please join the Telegram group. If you've got some questions, you can message me directly on there. Come here, you little monster. Come here. Yeah. You can message me directly on there, can't they? Um, and if you've got, um, you know, something you want to see on video, and if it fits in with what we're doing, I don't mind going to an area and doing a bit of filming. I've got lots and lots of things coming. Um, so yeah stay tuned and uh, see what else we can get on the channel for you and like I say if there is something specific join the Telegram channel and please just ask simple as that so um, thanks for tuning in guys really appreciate you uh, listening to me parrot on um, Hopefully the more lives I do, the slicker it gets. I'm sure this is a long way from slick at the moment. Um, and hopefully we get more people, we can get more comments, I can answer more questions. Um, and show, you know, day-to-day -day life in Russia from an English guy's perspective. And that's all this is. It's all it is. It is just my opinions, you know. It's... it's um, it's not, um, I haven't got a script other than the notes that I write down. So um, I have something to talk about. Um, but um, no, there's no, I can't see any FSB agents or KGB agents telling me what to say. I'm not paid. I don't earn any money from this. Um, there is no monetization on this channel. Um, I'm not going to say there never will be because, you know, never say never. Um, but certainly at the moment, understand that I do this just because I want to. Um, no other reason. Just literally because I've had the biggest shock of my life coming to Russia um, and seeing that it isn't what I was told. And I think it's important that everybody has an opportunity to see that, to make their own mind up. I'm not telling anyone to think a certain way, unlike... Um, a lot of other people that are demanding that you think a certain way I'm not doing that at all I am merely trying to show you you know and as the saying is uh, the truth will out so that's all I want to do is show you um, not lies just here this is this is the answer to that question this is the video that shows that and you can make your own mind up that's what we should all be able to do we shouldn't feel that we can't do that and we shouldn't live in a society that doesn't let us. Um, and one more thing, the um, absolute nonsense about um, if you don't say the right thing in Russia, you'll be locked up. Dear, oh dear. Um, yeah, just more propaganda, just more rubbish. You know, Russia has rules, Russia has laws, the same as every country. Um, but I was watching something the other day and I actually posted it on my ch Telegram channel. There's a guy talking about um, people um, imprisoned for um, speaking out on social media. And it was something like, it wasn't last year, but he was making the statement as if it was last year. So it was a few years old, this statement. Um, but effectively he said last year, I think it was 400 people in Russia were imprisoned for stuff they had said on social media um which you go oh, wow yeah see that proves the point and then he said there were 3,300 people um arrested in britain for what they said on social media and a third of the population and 66 times smaller so do you live in a democracy and if that's the democracy i don't want it Thanks very much. Um, thank you, guys. Um, let Chris know a contact and I'll send a couple of good places for learning language. Cool. 
yeah, like I say, join the Telegram. Let's have a chat. Anything you want to know, ask me in there. Have a good evening. Have a good morning. Have a good day, wherever you're tuning in from. And um, I'm going to go and have a glass of wine. So thanks for watching. See ya.